life on Earth, from the single-celled bacterial cells that populate every inch of the globe, to the multicellular fungi that serve as nutrient recyclers in various ecosystems, to plants big and small, to animals of all sizes, use the same basic DNA and RNA molecules to store and transmit genetic information. The differences between DNA and RNA are minute, but understanding their structure is an important foundation to understanding the molecular basis of genetics. While prokaryotes and eukaryotes use essentially the same molecules to store genes, there are important structural differences and methods these organisms use to transmit genetic information. This information will definitely be on the AP test. So, follow along as we cover everything you need to know about DNA and RNA structure. In this video, we'll look at section 6.1 of the AP Biology curriculum. We'll start by analyzing DNA and RNA structure in general. Then, we'll take a closer look at the different levels of DNA and RNA structure. After the first quiz, we'll see the difference between circular and linear chromosomes. Finally, we'll see what plasmids are and how they work. If you only need to review one of these sections, feel free to skip forward to the times outlined here. Otherwise, let's get started. Before we dive into the specific structures of DNA and RNA, let's take a look at the general purposes of these structures and the reasons they exist. This will be an extremely short review since we covered most of these topics in detail in our video on section 1.6. DNA exists as a double helix, with two strands held together by hydrogen bonds between nitrogenous bases. By contrast, RNA exists as a single strand. There are several functional reasons for this difference. DNA stores genetic information for long periods of time, and a double-stranded structure can help it protect the information from damage. The double-stranded structure also helps it detect when damage has taken place, since the base pairing between strands will become disrupted. RNA, on the other hand, exists only for a short period of time in most organisms and is not typically the primary source of heritable information. RNA is simply transcribed from the DNA and can easily exit the nucleus as a single strand to be translated into a protein. Some viruses break this rule, using RNA as a primary storage molecule for their genetic code. Between DNA and RNA, there are only a few structural differences at the molecular level. As their names imply, ribonucleic acid uses ribose in the sugar phosphate backbone, while deoxyribonucleic acid uses deoxyribose. While the only difference between these two sugar molecules is the presence of a single oxygen atom, this makes a structural and functional difference. The oxygen in ribose makes this section of the sugar molecule much larger and makes this section more electronegative. This tends to make RNA more reactive than DNA, part of the reason it is shorter lived. This not only changes the specific structure of the sugar phosphate backbone, but it also makes it harder for RNA to form a double helix structure unless the perfect base pairs are created, such as in tRNA molecules. The only other difference between DNA and RNA is the exact nucleotide monomers they use to create a strand. While these are mostly the same, DNA uses thymine, while RNA uses uracil. This difference helps the cell recognize the difference between DNA and RNA, and uracil is slightly less energetically expensive to produce, saving the cell some energy. Before we take a closer look at DNA and RNA structure, let's take a look at how these molecules actually store genetic information. Information is stored in DNA and RNA in the sequence of nucleotides within each molecule. This sequence is copied during RNA transcription, creating an RNA molecule that carries the same information. This RNA molecule leaves the nucleus, and it is translated into a protein by a ribosome. Within the ribosome, sets of three nucleotides called codons are matched to anticodons on tRNA molecules. Each tRNA has a specialized anticodon and carries a specific amino acid. One reason we assume that all life on Earth comes from a common ancestor is that all organisms use the same basic code to tell ribosomes how to construct proteins. This codon is read in a sequence from the first nucleotide to the second to the third to determine what amino acid is added to the growing polypeptide chain. For example, 
a codon of GAA signals to the ribosome that it should add glutamic acid to the growing polypeptide chain in all organisms. Think about this. You, this praying mantis, the cricket that it's eating, and the plant that it is standing on all use DNA in the same essential way to store genetic information. While the information you store is much different, the DNA and RNA you store it with are the same as every other living creature on Earth. Keep this in mind as we continue. Like proteins, DNA and RNA have a primary, secondary, tertiary, and even quaternary structure. Primary structure is made from the specific sequence of nucleotides. Secondary structure is formed mostly by base pairing, making a helix between two strands or a stem loop when one strand folds back on itself. The tertiary structure of both DNA and RNA is formed both by base pairing and the unique interactions between different nucleotides and the sugar phosphate backbone. Quaternary structure is formed when DNA or RNA molecules form larger complexes with other nucleic acids or proteins. Since many of these structures are formed by the process of base pairing, Let's take a closer look at how this works. If you remember how hydrogen bonds work from Unit 1, you remember that hydrogen bonds are formed between the positive and negative charges on two polar molecules. The purines, with a double ring structure, form hydrogen bonds with a specific pyrimidine, with a single ring structure. Since each nucleotide base has a specific charge, it can only bind with its complementary nucleotide base. So, G always binds with C, while A always binds with T, or uracil in the case of RNA. If the bases approach each other in any other combination, similar charges repel each other. Therefore, correct base pairing is necessary for the normal double helix structure of DNA and the several different forms of fold-in RNA, such as transfer RNA or ribosomal RNA. This base pairing is an important mechanism that controls several aspects of DNA and RNA structure. In a DNA molecule, base pairing is the main method that DNA replication takes place. Each new nucleotide base pairs with the nucleotide in front of DNA polymerase, which fuses it to the growing sugar phosphate backbone. This process creates two double helices out of one. Though RNA molecules are created in a similar fashion, the ribose sugar backbone and the uracil nucleotides used to create this RNA are slightly less stable and create less stable hydrogen bonding between base pairs. This allows the RNA molecule to leave the nucleus as a single strand. However, certain sequences, such as those that have evolved to be tRNA molecules, have a specific sequence of nucleotides that can base pair with each other if folded into the right shape. RNAs with tertiary shapes such as this serve a number of different roles within cells. Now that we have covered the basics of DNA and RNA structure and the mechanisms of base pairing that create this structure, let's see if you can answer some AP style questions. Pause the video now and take this short quiz. You will find answers to all of the questions in this video through the quick test prep link in this video's description. Let's turn our attention to the structure of DNA and RNA on a higher level, chromosomes. Chromosomes are made up of many genes, and each gene contains a large number of nucleotide base pairs, somewhere between a few thousand and a few million, depending on the gene. Each gene is made up of exons, the coding regions that carry genetic data, and introns, non-coding regions that separate exons. The purpose of introns is not well established, but many genes have a far greater number of nucleotides within introns than exons. As these genes are transcribed into RNA and processed into mRNA, the introns will be removed, a process covered in our video on section 6.3. These genes are all connected together into a long sequence. Considering that the human genome contains around 20,000 genes made up of 3.2 billion base pairs, this is an extremely long strand of DNA. Stretched out end to end, these genes would be nearly six feet long. However, DNA is wrapped around protein complexes called histones to create nucleosomes. Much like wrapping up a ball of yarn, this greatly reduces the length of each chromosome. Further, 
These nucleosomes pack tightly together into a complex structure that further condenses the DNA into a chromatin fiber. Chromatin can be packed together into a very dense structure, which is how we can see individual chromosomes during mitosis and meiosis. During interphase of the cell cycle, the chromosomes relax into a loose structure so that the DNA can be transcribed into RNA and replicated in preparation for the next cell division. Chromosomes like this that use histones to compact themselves are known as linear chromosomes and are seen mostly in eukaryotic organisms. By contrast, most prokaryotes use a much smaller circular chromosome. While we often depict them together, in reality, a linear chromosome is many times larger than a circular chromosome and typically carries many more genes. We also typically depict chromosomes in an X shape, but this is not always accurate. First off, the X shape represents a duplicated chromosome, two sister chromatids bound at the centromere. Furthermore, the centromere of linear chromosomes is not always located in the middle of the chromosome. It can be at the top or closer to one end than the other. Now's a good time to take a ride on the wild side. Biology is more fun if you go outside and see nature for yourself. Plus, stretching your legs in nature is a great study break. When we come back, we'll see how bacteria can share genetic material without sexual reproduction. Finally, let's take a quick look at prokaryotic genomes. While most prokaryotes reproduce asexually and only have a single circular chromosome, which limits genetic variation, most prokaryotic organisms can also exchange small, circular units of DNA known as plasmids. A plasmid is a chunk of DNA that contains as little as one gene, making it much smaller than the main circular chromosome of a prokaryote. These plasmids may carry genes that can help a bacteria survive. Since many bacterial cells benefit when they live in colonies that can create biofilms and other defensive mechanisms, bacterial cells gain a measure of fitness when they can help other bacteria survive. Bacterial cells can share genes carried in plasmids through the parasexual reproduction method of bacterial conjugation. During this process, the plasmid is replicated then, it is passed through a channel between the two bacterial cells. Plasmids are known to carry many important genes, such as those that confer antibiotic resistance or enzymes necessary to process a particular food source. By passing these genes to another bacterial cell, the bacterium can greatly increase how quickly a colony is formed, protecting itself in the process. However, scientists can also use plasmids to place certain genes within bacterial cells. By modifying a plasmid to contain pieces of foreign DNA, called recombinant DNA because it's from different species, scientists can put almost any gene they want to into a bacterial colony. The plasmids are created, bacteria heated up and cooled down to help the plasmids slip through the cell membrane, and some of the bacteria take up and successfully express the genes within the plasmid. When they reproduce, they carry this new gene with them. In a simple example, scientists were able to take normal E. coli bacteria and introduce a gene that causes fluorescence in jellyfish. When this plasmid is successfully incorporated into a colony, the whole colony glows green. But this cool trick can also be used for more important reasons than just getting bacteria to glow. Human insulin, an important protein hormone used as medicine by people with diabetes, is produced by bacteria that have been transformed with recombinant DNA. Now that we've covered plasmids and the different types of chromosomes, let's check and see if you picked up on everything. Pause the video now and take this short quiz. You can find answers to these questions through the quick test prep link in this video's description. Be sure to check out all of the other AP Biology resources we have created if you need more study materials. Thanks for watching. Please like this video if you found it helpful and informative. Leave us comments if you still have questions about DNA or RNA structure. Be sure to subscribe to the Biology Dictionary YouTube channel to find all of our AP Biology videos and study resources. Good luck!